These are four slides that I presented in the DOE review that uh, Lu Lucia talked about, results of relatively early work at S SRI showing what the effect looks like when it's uh, happening. You, you take your electrochemical current density, looking at the top left uh, graph, the green is the electrochemical current density. You ramp it up, you ramp it up. At a certain point, rather a large amount of uh, current for an electrochemical cell, about 275 milliamps per square centimeter, the excess power kicks off in the heavy water cell, the red, but in the natural water cell, uh, normal water, the water that we uh, drink cell, there is no evidence of excess heat and never has been in any of our experiments. So the effect increases with current density. You can see bottom right, the same data, uh, light water blue, heavy water red, uh, a period of no action, and then all of a sudden the current density with the, with, with the excess power will increase with current density more or less uh, linearly. The bottom left um, is, a, um, is a plot of a larger heat effect. I think this is going up to about seven uh, watts. You can see the error bars here. We've had, this is not a small effect, and it's not statistically a small effect. We've had uh, observations of uh, excess heat uh, at 90 sigma, I think, is a large, 90 times the measurement uncertainty. So there's no statistical ambiguity about the presence of the effect. The effect, when it's there, is clear to see, stays for long periods of time. And the top right quadrant is the curve of mine that's probably been most plagiarized, is the, power, uh, the, the plot of uh, excess power as a function of... Um, Loading, the deuterium to palladium loading ratio. The point of all that electrochemistry was to load deuterium inside the palladium. Palladium is unique, actually, in that it, at room temperature, absorbs very significant amounts of hydrogen and deuterium up to a loading ratio of one to one or so. So one atom of deuterium per one atom of hydrogen. The effect that we're looking at, according to this curve, doesn't start at all until you get a loading of about 0 0.9, 0 0.875 in this particular slide, and increases somewhat parabolically above that uh, point. I'm hung up on something. Why did you use air-saturated water? That's what, if you have an open bath of water, that's what it is. You're uh, pulling a vacuum on it. We're not. Why not? I mean, because now you're, you've got... The water is, water is, comp the, the cell is hermetic, so the water never gets to the cell. If we could use, the question, question is why, why do I use air-saturated water? It's actually a complete red herring because the uh, uh, heat capacity is very little different between air-saturated water and, and, and uh, water. It uh, differs in the last significant digit, but we used it because that was the, what the water in our constant temperature bath was. So um, at a certain, oh, that's a better uh, pointer. At a certain point, we developed a uh, equation that pretty much predicts the effect that we're talking about. Excess power is proportional to the loading x minus this threshold value, 0.875, and that's a squared function. The current density minus this current density threshold, and the last term here, the magnitude of uh, the the uh, amount of uh, deuterium that's entering and leaving the system. In no case of any cold fusion experiment that I'm aware of is the effect produced under equilibrium conditions. It's produced when you get a very high thermodynamic condition, when you pump it very high and start to move it. In electrochemistry, we have the ability to move uh, deuterium in and out through the interface by modulating, for example, the current uh, density. But the very first observation we made of this effect we didn't control, I call it a breathing mode. The palladium in a successful uh, excess heat producing experiment sort of breathes in um, deuterium, expanding as it does so, and, and then uh, expels it in a rhythmic uh, breathing mode. And the amplitude of that breathing mode is proportional to the excess power. And it doesn't really seem to matter whether the deuterium is going in or coming out. 
Of course, you can't uh, have it come in for a very long time or it fills up. You can't have it go out for a very long time or it falls below the loading threshold. But the uh, well, best thing is an oscillation. And we tried very hard to, to uh, create that oscillation in loading. But the, the most successful experiments we had in the early days, that breathing mode seemed to uh, kick off all by itself. Is there a question in the back? I don't know why. I'm an empiricist. Not because I want to be. That's all I got. But uh, that, that's what it looks like. Uh, so here's the predictive uh, function, um, the green. And here the, in the purple are the uh, measured uh, uh, data. So the correlation between these two, a uh, cross-correlation function, this is about 73% of the Predictive green function is represented in the blue uh, observed excess heat. So we have, the, the, I'll get to you in a second, but the power of that equation isn't that we can use it necessarily to create a, you know, a, a machine that we can use and sell. The power of this equation is that we can understand our failures. If you fail to meet any of these criteria, and there's one more, loading threshold, current density threshold, flux through the interface. If you fail to meet any of these criteria, you will not see the effect. So I have a question about time scale. It looks like it takes hundreds of hours for uh, an experiment to take place. Is there a reason why this is, takes such a long? Hundreds of hours. Good question. 